Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Adon Alum Messianic Congregation. We are certainly uh, glad to have you with us this evening. Uh, we like to point out that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, uh, we are here to pro proclaim the Jewishness of our Messiah Yeshua, the Jewishness of our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew uh, in some of our songs and some of the prayers. But we will translate the Hebrew because we see ourselves as a community, uh, as the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, talked about in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 when he describes Jew and Gentile coming together uh, to worship as one. And so we uh, are blessed to come together at this time, the Shabbat, this uh, time that the Lord has established each week uh, as we uh, remember that He is our Creator, uh, the Creator of the universe, and we remember that He heard the cries of our people when we were <laughs> enslaved in Egypt, and He sent a deliverer, uh, and then we saw that as a picture of when He uh, heard our cries because we were in bondage to sin, and He sent His Son as our deliverer. So uh, as we come together for this weekly divine appointment established by the creator of the universe, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you. We're going to begin our service uh, in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candle. So I'm going to ask Mae Galloway to come up to usher in the Sabbath for us. And as we often point out, frequently by tradition, there are two candles that are lit because there are two primary instructions regarding the Sabbath. We are told to Zahor, to remember the Sabbath, and to Shamor, to keep or guard the Sabbath, Lakadsho, to keep it holy. us by your word and given us Yeshua our Messiah and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, May. And now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Fred Scott, and ask everyone to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. This prayer is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, uh, we will affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our Creator. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the uh, English translation, followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6. Together, the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. The Ahavta e Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join with me in agreement as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu velohavo tenu Eloheavraham Elohe Yitzchak velohe Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together again, Lord, uh, to come together uh, in worship, in praise, uh, Lord, as we reflect on uh, how you have provided so many blessings this past week that we take most of them for granted. Amen. Lord, we thank you for uh, those blessings, and we thank you for the ultimate blessing, the gift uh, that you have provided, made available to each one of us, the sacrifice of your son, so that we might have not only forgiveness for our sins, but a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. And Lord, we just ask you to speak to the hearts of our Jewish people gathered in synagogues around the world, Lord, uh, as we remember the events that are taking place in Israel, as we pray that you would uh, give wisdom to uh, the leaders of that nation, that they would trust in you, Lord, uh, as the one who can protect them from their enemies. Lord, that you would perform even the miracle that may be needed to uh, bring the hostages back home safely. Yeah. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you would uh, cause those who are your followers, Lord, who say they um, worship you and praise you, Lord, may they realize that uh, Jerusalem is, you have described as the apple of your eye, that uh, Lord, you have are the faithful God and that you will fulfill every promise that you have made uh, to the Jewish people, giving us confidence that you will keep your promises to us. So Lord, we pray blessings uh, in that situation, knowing that you can take what the enemy int intends for evil and use it for good. And Lord, we ask you to speak to the hearts of each one who is here tonight, uh, that eyes would be open to see and ears would be open to hear from you this evening, Lord. Hearts open to receive. You accomplish your purposes that you might receive the glory. We seek your anointing on the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, uh, the meeting that we're going to hold afterwards, Lord, as you have uh, given us much favor with our new building uh, that we are continuing to renovate. And Lord, uh, even uh, we are trusting you uh, to provide in accordance with your will, Lord. Uh, perhaps even more space um, for us to use in the area. And Lord, we just dedicate this service to you. We ask you to use it for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now I'm going to call up Janiel Scott to bring us our announcements for this week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Adon Olam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you've not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so that we can get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. You will also find a visitor's card which we would ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we're blessed to have you with us this evening. After the service tonight, we will have a brief members meeting to talk about our efforts to purchase additional land next to our new building. This Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., we will continue our class on witnessing in today's culture. Tuesday, we will be talking about political correctness and cancel culture. We will have our Hebrew class afterward. On Sunday, March 3rd at 4 p.m., we will have our annual members business meeting. If you are interested in becoming a member, please see Rebitz and Sarah after the service. And in about five weeks, we will be observing Purim. One of our AOMC traditions is to have what we call our no talent show, <laughs> where we give people an opportunity to display their talent or lack thereof in a humorous way. We will be showing a video of past No Talent shows after the service to give you an idea of what we are looking for. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us this evening. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Janiel. 
Now we are going to chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. This prayer, uh, the chant is the Hebrew of Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, and we'll chant uh, the Hebrew, and then we will have the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. The Shamru, the name is right here, and a Shabbat, La So, and a Shabbat, let your tumble read, O The Shamru, the name is right here, and a Shabbat, La So, and a Shabbat. translation together. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat in the New Covenant Scriptures, we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the Scripture portion of our service, and I will call forward our ARC opener, Mark Bates, uh, as well as Randall Anderson, who will be leading us in this portion of the service. And we would ask that when the ARC is opened, if you would please stand. The Ark is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll, known as the Torah. And uh, <clears throat> the Torah it contains the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. Also, the term Ark reminds us of the Ark of the Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. Shabbat shalom, y'all. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Sion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, 
Great is our Lord. Holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Stephen, son of Yeshua, and Michelle, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Bar Kot Adonai Hamvarach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Benatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Notein HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. <clears throat> this is the eighth day of the twelfth month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Adar 1. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Exodus, chapter 25, verses 1 through 8. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Shemot. We'll be reading from chapter 25, verses 1 through 8 found on page 88 of the Complete Jewish Bible. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Adonai said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to take up a collection for me. Accept a contribution from anyone who wholeheartedly wants to give. The contribution you are to take from them is to consist of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skin, and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, Spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other stones to be set for the ritual vest and breastplate. <clears throat> they are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the blessing following the reading of the Torah. <clears throat> Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natam lanu Torah tenet, Lechai olam natam etachinu, Baruch atah Adonai, Noten haTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. V'zod ha-Torah,
before the reading of the Haftarah. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, <clears throat> who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. 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 Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Malachim Aleph. We'll be reading from chapter 6, verses 11 through 14, found on page 374 of the Complete Jewish Bible. Then this word of Adonai came to Solomon. Concerning this house which you are building, if you will live according to my regulations, follow my rulings, and observe all my mitzvah and live by them, then I will establish with you my promise that I made to David your father. I will live in it among the people of Israel, and I would not abandon my people Israel. So Solomon finished building the house. The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, Righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. 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 <clears throat> and now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech halom, Asher natam malu Mashiach Yeshua, Vahani roshel habrit hachasha, Baruch atah Adonai, Lothain habrit hachashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the new covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. <coughs> our group HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yehudim Meshikim. We'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, found on page 1497, Complete Jewish Bible.
Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol who has passed through to the highest heaven, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge is true. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol unable to empathize with our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted just as we are, the only difference being that he did not sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Amen. And now, the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu Alech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu HaDavar HaMet, Lechai Olam Nata Betochenu, Baruch atah Adonai, No Tein HaBrit HaKadoshah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah. For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, y'all may be seated. Join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently He turns away His anger and does not stir up all His wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Now I would like to uh, dismiss all of those aged 11 years old and younger uh, to go to a class. And we pray that the Lord will bless you in your time in your class and that you will learn a lot about the Lord and how he deals with his people. Just like we're going to do this evening. Uh, in last week's portion, just to bring you up to date a little bit, called uh, Mishpatim, which means judgments, the Israelites received 74 of the 613 commandments that the rabbis count in the Torah. We saw that the first Mishpat talked about how Israelite servants were to be treated. We also saw in the portion a messenger, sometimes translated as angel, who would guard the people on their way to the place that the Lord had prepared for them. The people are told there to hearken to the messenger's words. The Lord says he has placed his name in the heart of the messenger. 
He is the one who will en enable them to be victorious over the inhabitants of the lands that they will be coming to. So who is this protector, this guardian messenger? He's thought by many to be Yeshua before he comes to earth in human form. We also talked about from last week's portion that uh, in this giving of the covenant, there is a ceremony associated with it. Uh, the Lord establishing this covenant between himself and the children of Israel, uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier during, during the Vishamru. First, the people offered up sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses reads the Sefer Habrit, the book of the covenant, to the people. And the people, for the third time in this portion, commit to doing all that the Lord has spoken. Actually, it's for the third time. I'm not sure they're all in the portion. Uh, and finally, Moses takes the blood of the sacrifices, sprinkles it on the people, and says, This is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, in that, once again, we see kind of a picture because the shedding of blood also accompanied the final covenant renewal. In Luke 22, verse 20, Yeshua takes the cup after the Passover meal and says to his followers, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, ratified by my blood which is poured out for you. With Moses, it was the blood of animal sacrifices but in this final covenant renewal that Yeshua inaugurates, it's not animal blood that is sprinkled, but the blood of God's Son that is poured out on our behalf. Let us just go to the Lord in prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we just come before this evening, and Lord, we just uh, desire divine revelation from your word for our lives this evening, Lord. Uh, that you would help us to better understand truths that we find in the written revelation that you provided to your people long ago. And Lord, I just uh, pray that um, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> At the end of last week's portion, Moses approaches the mountain. He goes up into the cloud uh, and then goes up the mountain where over the next 40 days, he will receive instructions for the people from the Lord. And this week's Torah portion starts out, as we read earlier, with the Lord's first instruction to Moses, telling him that the people are to build a place where the Lord would be able to dwell in the midst of his people. This week's portion is called terumah, which means offering. And in this case, we're talking about a voluntary offering to be given by the Israelites in order to obtain the materials to be used to build the tabernacle and its furnishings. The portion consists of Exodus chapters 25 through 27. Now, if you didn't have Messianic calendars, you might think that I was just doing this to prepare to take up an offering for this property we want to purchase <laughs> next door to our building. But the reality is, this is just the, the portion for this week that, you know, sometimes we feel like we just kind of sit back and see what miracle the Lord is going to perform in various situations, but he frequently calls us to get involved. And fortunately, he doesn't always demand that we get involved. <laughs> Sometimes he wants to see, are we willing? Do we desire to be a part of what he is doing in our lives, in the life of our congregation, in our community, even in our world today? The Lord uh, says to Moses, as we read earlier from uh, Shemot, Exodus 25, verse 2, speak to the people of Israel that they may take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. You know, a lot of times people think that the New Covenant Scriptures is where we read all about the Lord's grace and, and how, you know, uh, much he wants to bless his people. 
And in the Old Testament, as they call it, the Hebrew scriptures, that's where we see the, the law and the legal requirements and just all these rules uh, that have to be followed and that the people are compelled to do, not realizing that God's revelation is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. There are aspects of judgment that we find in the New Covenant Scriptures. We find harshness sometimes in the New Covenant Scriptures. Um, <clears throat> you know, Yeshua said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, that, that wasn't the nicest words that have ever been said. <laughs> but the reality is people tend to come up with their own interpretation and then make things fit. The reality is we find much grace in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, because we need grace because none of us is able to keep Torah perfectly. There was only one who ever came who could keep Torah perfectly, and that was Yeshua. And it turns out that he is the sacrifice that is able to, enables me to obtain atonement despite the fact that I am unable to keep it perfectly. And the Lord wants our hearts. Uh, the, the promise of the new covenant, the Brit Kadashah, prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. The Lord says, he will write, he says, my Torah on their inward parts and on their hearts. And so um, the reality is, he is looking for hearts that are softened to him. The world will harden our hearts, but will we soften our hearts to the one who has made us, the one who has blessed us, the one who has revealed truths to us uh, that we would otherwise not be able to understand. And the one who one day is going to rule and reign with us, or actually we're going to rule and reign with him. We find the concept of giving from the heart under the new covenant as well. Surprise, surprise. Like I said, we find uh, virtually, you know, the types and shadows that we see in the Hebrew scriptures are often fulfilled in the new covenant scriptures, but many concepts from the New Covenant Scriptures we really only understand when we go back to the Hebrew Scriptures and see when they're, they're first uh, referred to. So in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, it says, Let each one give as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, no matter what I say, not under compulsion. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. We're supposed to take that frown, turn it upside down, right? <clears throat> a number of people over the years uh, in this congregation have given generously, faithfully, and we hope cheerfully uh, to this ministry such that we are able um, to purchase this building in, in Greenville. And uh, with um, Fred Scott overseeing the renovation, we are hopeful that we will be uh, moving there uh, in the next few months, and we're excited about that. <clears throat> we're, I think we're looking at about an April-May time frame, but we're not holding anybody's feet to the fire on that because it's not always easy to get those contractors out there. But Fred's doing a wonderful job overseeing it. Mick is there on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and so I'm pretty confident that uh, what we are expecting is what we're going to uh, end up with. But what do instructions that we are going to read about tonight concerning the fabrication of the tabernacle tell us today? You know, many believers think that other than maybe a symbolic interpretation, the concept of the tabernacle is not really meaningful to us anymore. It's a Old Testament concept <laughs> from a long time ago. It no longer exists. But I believe we'll see several reasons why, in fact, the tabernacle helps us to better understand God's truths. Now, first of all, according to Hebrews 9, verse 11, the earthly tabernacle isn't just some idea that the Lord came up with and said, hey, this would be a good thing for the children of Israel to work on. It's a copy of another tabernacle, a tabernacle that exists in a different place. Uh, in God's dwelling place in the heavens. Uh, but he also wanted them um, to make a copy 
of this greater and more perfect tabernacle, one that had not been made by human hands. Hebrews 8 verse 2 describes the heavenly tabernacle as the true tent, the true ohel in the Hebrew, uh, which the Lord Adonai has set up, not man. So why are the people told to build an earthly tabernacle in the first place? Well, we've already talked about it. We uh, concluded our uh, scripture reading earlier this evening. The Lord is looking for a holy separated place where he can dwell in the midst of his people. Exodus 25 verse 8 says, And they are to make me a sanctuary. Uh, <clears throat> It doesn't say they're doing this so the Lord will have a place to live. It says in the Hebrew, Vashakanti Betocham, uh, meaning, and I will dwell among them. He has them build a place for him because he needs a place that satisfies his requirements of holiness so that he can dwell in the midst of his people. Now we have to remember. The Israelites have spent most of their lives experiencing what? Slavery in Egypt. And now he's brought them through the Red Sea. He's brought them out of the slavery. And he's brought them, um, he, he's bringing them to the land of promise. And now he is going to give them instructions. But his instructions involve having their God dwelling in their midst. And this is drastically different from what they would have experienced in Egypt. They, they are being reminded that their God is very different from the gods of the Egyptians. First of all, the Egyptian gods never sought to dwell among the people. Also, the Egyptians needed many gods to explain the world around them. The Israelites needed only one. And in the signs and wonders, the God of Israel has just demonstrated that he is more powerful than all of the gods of Egypt. The Israelites are to build a place suitable for their God who desires to dwell in their midst. In Exodus 25, verse 8, they're told to build a sanctuary. In Hebrew, it's mikdash. Let's say that together. Mikdash. And it actually comes from the same root as the word kodesh because it is a place of holiness, um, <clears throat> is, is what this term means. Then in Exodus 25, verse 9, we come to the instructions for the fabrication of the tabernacle and its furnishings, starting with the Aron, the ark, and its cover, the chaporet. We'll even try that one. Chaporet. Has the same Hebrew root as kippur as in Yom Kippur, as in the Day of Atonement. Atonement, which is why the TLV translation calls it the Atonement Cover. And the reality is that is somewhat redundant because the Hebrew word uh, Kippur also has the idea of covering. Uh, it's, sim it's a similar word from the same root as the pitch that Noah placed on the ark to make it waterproof. So that gives us an idea how complete the covering, the idea of that covering is. Uh, in that case, it's kafir. According to Vayikra, Leviticus 16, verse 15, the kaporet is where the high priest will sprinkle the blood of the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. And of course, this is the one day each year when the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies on behalf of the people to obtain atonement for the entire Israelite community. And that's why some translations refer to this chaporet, uh, the cover of the ark, as the mercy seat. The chaporet is made of gold, as are the two cherubim, cherubim, uh, on either end of the ark cover. In uh, Shemot, Exodus 25, verse 22, <coughs> The Lord tells Moses, There I will meet with you from above the chaporet, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, about all that I will speak to you, about all that I will give you in commandment 
for the sons of Israel. Not only is the Lord going to dwell in their midst, and that's probably mind-blowing enough, but now he says he's going to meet with Moses in the innermost part of the tabernacle and speak to him with instructions for the children of Israel. And in our New Covenant reading for this week, in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, we find that it's through our high priest, Yeshua, that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness. Remember, the Levitical high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies one day each year. And tradition says he would have a rope tied around him in case he had some issue in his life, some unatoned sin, whereby he did not satisfy the Lord's standard of holiness and would be struck dead on the spot. And then what do you do? How are you going to go in and get them? They have the rope to pull them out. It might be a little tough for that, the Levitical high priest, to have confidence on approaching the Ark of the Testimony. You know, you would think he's probably being a little bit cautious, going, am I okay? Uh, anyone seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Just saying. <clears throat> but we're told that we can confidently, boldly approach the throne of grace because we have Yeshua as our high priest. He was not a Levitical high priest, but according to Hebrews 7, verse 11, he was a priest after what order? The order of Melchizedek in the English, Malkitzedek in the Hebrew. And Hebrews 4.16 tells us that when we approach the throne of our gracious God, just as when the high priest approached the mercy seat, we can receive mercy. We can find grace in our time of need. The Torah portion continues with instructions on how to build the table of showbread, it is sometimes called. Actually, the Hebrew is lechem pani. So we're, we agree with the bread, lechem, bread, that's cool. But panim literally means faces. Uh, and so this is really more like uh, faces, a term that's used in terms of coming into the presence of the Lord, the way we describe that is coming before his face, uh, even though it's always found uh, in the plural in the Hebrew scriptures. Exodus 26 starts with instructions for making the roof of the tabernacle, which consists of animal hair and animal skins. And then we come to instructions for, to, for making the inner parts of the tabernacle, the holy place, uh, and the holy of holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Next, the Lord tells them how to make the parochet. Um, that is actually the Hebrew word for the curtain that serves as the divider between the holy place and the holy of holies. And as you know, in Matthew 27, verse 51, it tells us that at the time of Yeshua's death, this parochet, this curtain that blocked entrance to the Holy of Holies was torn in two from top to bottom, symbolizing that because of Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice, the Holy of Holies, the closest we can come to the Lord is no longer off limits to God's people. He desires intimate fellowship with his people. And the reality is, is what is going on in our own lives, uh, whether it's our lack of understanding, uh, whether it's our being caught up in what's going on in the world, seeking after its trophies, whether it's unconfessed sin uh, that keeps us from being able to approach him in intimacy. In Exodus 26, chapter 26, we find two other terms for the tabernacle. We've already talked about the mikdash, uh, the sanctuary, the place of holiness. In some verses in this chapter, it is called the ten, ha-ohel. Um, let's say that together, ha-ohel. And later it will be called the tent of meeting, which is ohel moed. Um, we can say that one, 
Ohel Moed. I'm going to learn a little bit of Hebrew, at least the terminology for the tabernacle, because sometimes it's referred to as one, sometimes as the other, because just like when we write a paper and we're not supposed to use the same words over and over, that's what the Lord learned in his English class as well. <laughs> Uses different terms because it's communicating different concepts about the role of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the tent of meeting. In Exodus 26, verse 30, it's called the Mishkan. Let's say that one. Mishkan. That has the, uh, uh, the Hebrew root that has the idea of dwelling, the dwelling presence. It's the same root uh, that we find for the word Shekinah, uh, or Shekinah, as we sang earlier, the dwelling presence of the Lord. And so um, the Mishkan is a description that is used to remind us that the creator of the universe who dwells in the heavenly realm is willing to come to earth to dwell in the midst of his people, to come to this fallen world that he might be able to fulfill the promises that he has made to the co to, uh, in the covenants that he has made um, with his people. That, that he would he desires to dwell in their midst, just as he desires, as I just said earlier, intimate fellowship with each one of us. Towards the end of Exodus chapter 26, the Lord tells Moses where the various items are to be located in the tabernacle. Uh, the Aron Edut, the Ark of the Testimony, and its uh, Chaporet, the cover, are to be placed inside the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies. The uh, table of the Lechem Panim, the bread of the presence, is to go just outside of the curtain that separates the holy place from the Holy of Holies. <coughs> the Kaporet. And the, uh, uh, the Parachet, I'm sorry. And the golden uh, lampstand, the Menorah, is to be placed opposite the table. And then in Exodus chapter 27, we find instructions for making the altar, the Mizbeach, which is to be located in the courtyard. Uh, as we also find instructions uh, after that for making the walls of the courtyard. And the Torah portion concludes with instructions for building the outer entrance to the courtyard. Now I want to talk about the Haftarah portion uh, for just a moment. Chosen by the rabbis, it's 1 Kings 5, verse 12 through chapter 6, verse 13. As Sh Shlomo, Hamelech, King Solomon, uh, is beginning construction of the first temple, as it is called today. And like the tabernacle, the temple will have a holy place and a holy of holies with the same furnishings. And the Lord says in 1 Kings 6, verse 13, the same thing as he said regarding the tabernacle, V'shachanti betoch b'nei Yisrael, and I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel. The verse ends with the Lord saying, and I will not forsake Ami Yisrael. Now, note, he didn't say a term that we sing sometimes, Am Yisrael, uh, the people of Israel. He says, Ami Yisrael, which means my people, Israel. According to 1 Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 1, 480 years after leaving Egypt, construction begins on what is called today the first temple. Despite all of the complaining of the Israelites in the wilderness, despite going after foreign gods during the time of the judges, Judges 2 verse 17 says, yet they did not listen to their judges, but instead worshiped other gods. Yet when the temple is completed, as we see in 1 Kings 8 verse 11, the kavod Adonai, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, a sign that the Lord is once again dwelling in the midst of the Jewish people. Now, for starters, this is a promise that we will see again. It's a promise he makes in the final covenant renewal 
with the Jewish people. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, it says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's in the prophecy of what the final renewal, the Brit Kadeshah, the new covenant, is all about. It's restoring what was supposed to exist in all of the earlier covenants. And God remains faithful. The, the people may be faithless, but what God demonstrates in his faithfulness, no matter how faithless the people are, his faithfulness is greater. And so it helps us to understand that our God will be faithful to every promise he has made to the Jewish people, to every promise that he has made to the followers of Messiah. They don't replace one another. They help us to better understand that we can have confidence in things that we have not seen. Sometimes I say to non-Jewish believers, how can you be confident that the Lord is on your side, that he will fight on your behalf in whatever battle you may face? You know, have you seen that? Have you seen him, you know, uh, deliver the victory in terms of giving you victory over your enemies? We've seen that in the life of the Jewish people. We've seen that with the nation of Israel. That gives us confidence that the battles we face spiritually, that we can count on him to be on our side and help us to have victory over our enemies in this world that are coming against us because of what we believe, because of whom we serve. And so the reality is um, the Jewish people have experienced it physically. That's what the scriptures reveal to us, that he said he would give them victory over their enemies, even when their enemies had, you know, vastly outnumbered them. We, we have holidays, the one coming up is, is one of our holidays where we celebrate our ability to defeat an enemy that was far superior in terms of numbers and far superior in terms of weaponry. And yet in Purim, we are going to celebrate that the one who sought our destruction, Haman, just seeing, giving you a chance to rehearse a little bit, <clears throat> actually is the one who is defeated and the Jewish people are victorious. And so that helps us to see that even when we are small in number, even when it seems like through fleshly eyes we are losing, us and God makes a majority. And he says that he will remain faithful to Israel, you know, in 1 Kings, all that idolatry and, and complaining and, and all of the waywardness of our Jewish people had already taken place. And the prophecy of the new covenant is even after more rebellion uh, and failure to follow. And, and having all the, first of all, the rebellion of setting up the northern kingdom and then all the kings who were allowing idol worship in their midst. And yet God promises the new covenant where despite all of that, he says, they will be my people and I will be their God. Amen. Today, the earthly tabernacle structure is gone. The temple's been destroyed, not once, but twice. And yet God still dwells in the midst of his people. Uh, as Paul Wilbur sings, our God no longer dwells in temples made of stone. He's chosen hearts of flesh to make his glory known. And that is based on 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, which describes us as temples of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that God's temple is to be holy. Based on this scripture, we should be asking ourselves, are we holy? Is our temple pure? You know, we sang earlier, purify me. And one thing I really liked about the way the song is structured it started out purify me, but it ended up with purify us. Because sometimes, especially in the body of believers, we tend to focus on our relationship to the Lord on an individual basis. But his promises are given primarily as a community um, to the Jewish people. It's not for each individual Jewish person. That is determined by whether or not they decide to remain faithful to the covenant. 
but God's promises are to the Jewish people as a whole to demonstrate his power over all the gods of this world. We are living in a time where his kingdom is advancing into the kingdom of this world. And believe me, this world does not like it. And there is a battle raging. There's no doubt about it. If you want to find out more details, come on Tuesday night. Because we're talking about this battle and we're talking about how do we minister to those in the world that we're trying to reach in the midst of this battle. Uh, and, and we're seeking to understand, number one, how we can minister to them. And number two, how we're ministering what the Word of God says. How, what the Word of God says on these issues. Uh, but the reality is... It should be um, shocking to us that God is able to dwell in our fallen temples that we provide for him as a dwelling place. And the reality is our temples can be defiled by this world. The question is, will we call on him to help us to keep our temple clean? to keep our hearts pure and soften towards him? Have we allowed it to become defiled by the little g gods of this world? Are we guilty of idolatry, just like the Israelites? Is our temple holy so that we might have God's dwelling presence in our lives? Uh, you know, I, my experience is when it comes to walking with the Lord, it's not a, a moment by moment scenario. It's more a year by year. Are we walking with him long term? Are we living a life that is growing in an understanding of his truths and how we live it out? Are we uh, acknowledging his blessing in our lives uh, by giving of our time and our, our talents and our finances? The, the reality is um, that I really uh, feel like blessing tends to come on a long-term basis. In the flesh, we tend to focus on the struggles of this moment. That's why he's established one day every week where we separate ourselves from the cares of this world and that moment-by-moment -moment thinking. And we reflect on what is going on in our lives and what he has done for us. And we reflect on what he has done from the very beginning and what he is going to do in the very end. Uh, as we know that he will be faithful to all that he has said, that everything in, in the scriptures, uh, some of the things, the terminology is so strange to us, we can't even make sense out of exactly what it's talking about and how it's going to play out. But nonetheless, we know that it will come to pass because we see he performed the greatest miracle in the last 1900 years by reestablishing the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Once again, the enemy is not happy about that. And he is putting up a battle, as we can see. I, I mentioned to some people a couple of years ago, you know, it's pretty quiet over there. I know that's not going to last very long. Uh, that is a stumbling stone to the world. And so they are constantly waging battle to try to take away what God has given to the Jewish people, to make it seem like they are not worthy to be in that land. And the reality is they're right about that. They are not worthy. But God doesn't go based on their worthiness. He goes based on the promises that he has made, the faith of the forefathers, his unconditional love toward them. We are called to go into the world and to change the world, not seek after its trophies. Are we uh, seeking after what this world can offer us? Or are we serving the creator of the universe with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? We're to live in the world, but we're not to be conformed to it. Romans 12 verse 2 tells us we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might know God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. In Hebrews 9 verse 4, we find a description of what was kept in the ark. A golden jar of manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. But according to 1 Kings 8 verse 9, only the tablets were in the ark when it was placed in the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. The tablets served to remind 
the people to that they have received revelation, his written instructions by his own finger that he has provided to them so that they will know how he wants them to live, so that they will be able to get along with their fellow man, so that they will be able to establish boundaries between them and those who live around them. God's purpose for his people was partially fulfilled in the birth of Messiah Yeshua. You know, it, it, the concept of Mashiach, the anointed one, the Messiah is a Jewish concept. He was birthed to a Jewish man and a Jewish woman. His mother was named Miriam. His father was named Yosef. A good Jewish boy, a good Jewish girl. Uh, even though you might have been told otherwise when they're given the names Mary and, and Joseph, it's a whole different picture sometimes. But the reality is, according to Matthew 23, verse 39, there is a greater fulfillment yet to come. Because Messiah came the first time to, pro to deal with the bondage that we had to sin. He's coming back to receive his people unto him, to deliver the Jewish people uh, out of the hands of their enemies and the destruction they seek. According to Matthew 23, verse 20, uh, 39, he will return when the Jewish people say, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That should give us a burden to take the message of Messiah to our Jewish people, if for no other reason. At that time, he will dwell amongst his people once again, but not as a lamb this time. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, with a sword in his mouth, with fire in his eyes. And that day will be a glorious day for some and a fearful day for others. Amen. In that day, all who have rejected Messiah Yeshua will experience judgments for, judgment for their sins, according to Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. In that day, God will again be king over his people, according to Israel, uh, his people Israel, according to Zechariah 8, verse 8. In that day, Israel's enemies will be judged for how they've treated God's people, Amen. according to Joel 3, verse 19. In that day, every knee will bow to him, According to Isaiah 45, verse 23, every tongue will confess that Yeshua, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father, according to Philippians 2, verse 10. In that day, the enemy and his supporters, the adversary, Hasatan, Satan, according to Revelation 20, verse 10, uh, hell and death as well will be cast into the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. And in that day, Yeshua will rule and reign with his followers from his throne in Jerusalem. That's you and me. That's our part, according to Revelation 4, verses 9 through 11. And then according to Revelation 21, verse 3, the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven. There will be a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So the tabernacle is helping us to see that that is what God is intending to do in the ultimate fulfillment of his dwelling with his people. They will be his people and God himself will be among them and be their God. Tonight we've talked about how the creator of the universe instructed the children of Israel to build a place where he could dwell in their midst as he entered into this covenant relationship with the people. Today, the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua, which took place as part of the final covenant renewal, through that, we too are able to come into the presence of the Lord. We can boldly approach the throne of God to receive his mercy and grace when we need it most. But perhaps you're here and you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah. We've just laid out all the blessings associated with accepting the sacrifice that he provides. The reality is we are either for the Lord or against him. There's no middle ground. And the only way we can be for the Lord, it can't be based on our own righteousness, our own good deeds, because God looks down and when he sees the works of our hands, he sees the sin that we have committed. And so we need forgiveness for that sin. And he has provided the only way. Yeshua, when he came, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father 
except through me, except by me, John 14, 6. And so the reality is there's only one way that we can be reconciled with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father. So if you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, if you're here tonight or if you're watching on the video, we are going to give you that opportunity right now to receive the covenant promise of faithfulness, the ultimate demonstration of of love that God has provided. So with every eye closed and with every head bowed, if you are ready, if you feel the leading of the Spirit to say, yes, I need Yeshua as my Messiah tonight. You've never done this before. All you have to do is raise your hand and you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. Praise the Lord. However, we don't just accept that sacrifice, and that's all we need to do. He continues to conform us to the image of His Son. We continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So even if you're already a follower of Messiah, um, are you willing to say to the Lord tonight what our people Israel said long ago? All that the Lord has spoken, I will do my best to do. Or perhaps um, you realize that uh, you struggled with being a cheerful giver and you want to ask the Lord to help you in that area. Or maybe you need a cleansing for your temple, the temple of his spirit. Or perhaps you just need the grace that he dispenses from his throne in some area where you've been struggling. If you desire to make a change in one of these areas that he has shown you, I would just encourage you to raise your hand as a sign of your commitment. I'm not even going to, to look out there because this is between you and the Lord saying, yes, Lord, I need that cleansing. Yes, Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. Yes, Lord, I want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, I want to change the way you've shown me to change. As Lord, I pray we would not take the privilege of being able to come into your presence for granted. That we would continue to press forward toward the mark of the high calling in Messiah Yeshua. That we would continue to be conformed in a greater way to the image of your Son. That we might draw closer to you. That your love would fill us up and overflow to those around us for your glory. And Lord, we humbly ask that you would do these things in our lives and in the life of our congregation, in the life of our Jewish people, our people Israel, in the life of our local community, Lord, accomplish your purposes. Use us for your purposes. And everyone said, Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Now we are going to close our service with some traditional closing blessings and a closing song. At this time I'm going to ask our cantor to come back up. And we will say the blessing over the fruit of the vine uh, called the Kiddush, which comes from the same root as Kadosh and Mikdash, uh, as we sanctify the service unto the Lord. And in the Hamotzi, we thank him for his provision. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight. A reminder that we will have a brief meeting. Those who are not members are welcome to go outside and get dibs on the food and fellowship. Uh, and we will hopefully follow you shortly. If you want to stay for the meeting, we'll just be talking about uh, the land that um, has uh, come available and what that situation means. And uh, you're welcome to stay for the meeting as well. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Amen. And some folks are screaming out Lachayim, which is a traditional Jewish toast that means to life, because the Lord tells us he sets before us life and death, blessing and curse, and encourages us to choose life. Eloheinu melech alam, hamotzi lechem in haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. Amen. Amen.
And now we are going to uh, ask everyone to please stand as we will pre be pronouncing a blessing found in Numbers chapter 6, where the Lord says, these are the words, he tells Moses, these are the words to your brother Aaron, the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest. These are the words that he is to say as my words of blessing over my people. We encourage you to stand and receive these words of blessing from the Lord tonight. Yevarecha Adonai, Vayishmarecha, Yair Adonai, Panabalecha, Vachuneka, Yasah Adonai, Panabalecha, the Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant unto you his peace. Amen. <clears throat> And now we will have our closing song. It's where we get the name of our congregation, the Adon Alam. It describes, it's a traditional song that we used to sing in the synagogue growing up, but I had no idea what I was singing because we only sang it in the Hebrew. But as you'll see in the English, it describes the uniqueness of our Creator. Adon Alam, Hashem Shabbat Shalom.